We need, we need some masala. So, uh, they don't burn. Yeah, I think so. They don't burn and uh, as used as a wall and they don't off gas and they are indigenous to the entire planet and, and you can make uh, super walls out of them. And so uh, that's the general look at the, the basics. I think uh, we could take a 10 minute break and let everybody walk around and we'll get back into some system stuff. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to take a few questions, and people have been asking me questions, so I'm asking them to ask them again in front of everybody so that everybody gets the answer. But we're talking here briefly about uh, uh, the permitting in, in New Mexico, for instance. In New Mexico is where we developed this, so in New Mexico you pretty much can get a permit as quick as any other building. Uh, in Colorado, some state, some counties don't even require a permit. Some counties uh, are harder, and some are like New Mexico. Uh, we have, I have an architect's license still in Colorado. They haven't taken it yet, so uh, uh, that helps sometimes. But uh, the we had, uh, I mean, we had people. This is again many stories like this. We had people that. We're in one county in Colorado where the plan checker was, was new. She was engineer educated and she just made it really difficult for these people. And they had been working for two and a half years to get a permit and finally they couldn't wait any longer. And they went ahead and got a permit for, they just decided to buy a manufactured home that they bring in and set on concrete blocks and that they could live in while they continued to fight for their, product, for their uh, permit for the airship. And they did it, and they went in. Uh, the, only, the only stumbling block on their permit for the manufactured home was they had to sign an affidavit that said they would not let any infants or elderly people go in the building for six months because of the off-gassing of all the weird materials in it. And, but they got the permit. They got the permit in a couple of weeks, where they'd been working on trying to get a permit for a carbon zero home for two and a half years. They ended up finally getting the permit, building the building, and getting a divorce. So, uh, so uh, somebody, you had a question. Uh, uh, did your company, do they do the uh, uh, package plans like Shell and um, Power uh, for people and? Yeah, we, we uh, go all over the world and we uh, do turnkey or what we call shell and systems. And there's a packaged plan book, but now when it, it, it's just simply out of date because what, when people choose something out of the packaged plan book, we try to move them into the new global application of that, which we don't have put into a packaged plan book yet, but it's still similar. And so, the, so a lot of people get us to do what we call shell and systems, and that's the structure uh, and the power, water, sewage systems installed. And sometimes no doors, uh, no floors, no ceilings. You, you, we define what you want us to leave out, and it keeps the price, you know, uh, cuts the price by 30, 35, even 40 percent. These buildings are labor intensive, so we keep these pies going. Usually it's like a uh, ballpark. It's like something like 35% uh, materials, 35% labor, and then uh, what's that, 70? And then uh, you got subcontractors like your excavator, your electrician, and your plumber. They end up being in the neighborhood of 15% and uh, subs and then uh, the rest of it is systems you know you, if, if you're if you're hiring a contractor like us to do it there's profit and then there's systems but the thing to consider is that labor and materials are pretty close to the same so if you're going to build the house you're in, and they're in the neighborhood of 35 percent so if you're going to build the building yourself or seriously participate in it there's where you can cut you can't really cut on materials they cost what they cost you can't cut on systems, they cost what they cost. 
If you know some subcontractors, maybe you can get a break. But if you're building or contracting the building yourself, you can cut profit out and greatly reduce labor uh, to the point where you can cut, you know, 35% out of the building. Now then, if you, if you do that and do shelling systems, you can, you know, the, the $205 a square foot that I say these costs can probably be cut in half depending on your approach. I say $205 a square foot because some people, uh, it, it just shows you what these cost if you absolutely outright buy it. I've had these seminars going on for, I don't know, 15 years probably or more. And I had, I, in, the, in the first book, I said uh, uh, beavers and wasps can build their own homes and people can't. And I made a big thing of that. Well. I had my head up my ass on that one because people, some people should not build their own house. <laughs> they, you know, they, I mean, I had, uh, I had two, in one seminar I had these two couples and they looked very much the same. I couldn't even, you know, I got them mixed up. The guy was tall and skinny. They were, you know, they were elderly, 50-ish maybe or late 40s or something. Uh, my heart bleeds for them. But, uh, the guy was tall and thin, the woman was short and heavy. Two couples almost looked identical. One of them, they both got all inspired and bought land around Taos and, and built, started building their airship. And they both, uh, I always advise people if you're going to do it yourself, start off with just one module. They, this was back in the days when we did use more than these packaged and, and the global designs. So I talked them both into just doing one U first to see how it went. And one couple did a U, was successful, did another one, did another one, did another one. I think they even did another one. They got a giant building full of food and everything. The other couple got one U not even done and got a divorce and hated me. You know, so they, these, these people couldn't even operate a shovel, whereas these people could, and they looked just the same. So you never can tell, but what I'm saying is some people... Should, you know, some people should do it, but when you make a blanket statement like beavers and wasps, you know, you're just uh, shallow thinking, I so, guess. So the 205 is, is basically if, if, pardon? Per square foot. Yeah, but I mean, that's turnkey to say have you build it all the way out through finish. Yeah, that's basically what it costs. And, then, and when we've, we've done it all over the world, and that is a figure that is, you know, in the U.S., you know, you can, you can get a... Uh, what do you call it, a, the same kind of home that Habitat for Humanity builds for probably $150 a square foot. You know, you can get a junky little frame home for less, but the price of a good, you know, brick veneered, well insulated thermal home that's not really a carbon zero home, but just a good home, is in that ballpark all over the U.S. And like I say, in Santa Fe, there are even a lot more. So you're not saving money on utilities. Right, and that's a point. Like, say you take... Uh, Say they cost the same. Say you, you compare it and an earthship costs 205 a square foot, which maybe equates to, say it costs 300 grand to get the size of a home you want. And, uh, and it costs the same to get a conventional home. And then your mortgage payment on 300 grand, if you're lucky, could be uh, you know, a couple of grand a month maybe. Uh, uh, and it would be the same here. Then on the conventional home, you'd have to add between 500 and 1,000 a month on utilities uh, to your living expenses, which would make them in the neighborhood of 3,000 a month. Whereas the Earthship, these buildings like the Corner Cottage, uh, the, they, the only thing they use uh, is cooking. And if I were living there, I would be cooking with a solar oven and uh, even I'd rather even use a microwave that runs off of the solar power system than uh, than a propane oven. So, but in the worst scenario, I'm saying, the utility bill on one of these homes in this community that we're doing all over the world is $100 a year. And that's for gas. $100 a year for your utility bill. So that's not bad. That doesn't even, that's not even worth putting in here. Whereas your 500 to 1,000 a month does affect your living expenses. So um, that's the, that's the, the overall living expenses of a carbon zero home can actually be less. Uh, does 
Did somebody else have a question on? Uh, well, there, were, <clears throat> there was one question you wanted to have come back, which was the structural integrity oh. of, a, of, a, of a can only or a bottle only. Oh, and somebody had a bearing strength yeah. co question too. So the, on the can walls, which you will probably be doing some of here in a little bit, uh, cans, bottles, uh, they're all laid either in cement or uh, dirt, mud. And a, a can wall, for instance, is laid like this on a patty of cement. And then you put another patty of cement and the cans are there. The point here is that the cement is sort of like a matrix that the cans are in. And, and the truth is, the cans could just, they won't because they're aluminum but they could erode away and just be gone. And the, you'd, have a, you'd have a wall that was cement matrix with voids in it. So the point here is that the structure of a can wall is really the cement matrix. And so, so in, by virtue of that, cans are simply a method of forming cement or, or mud wall. So they're, they're really, there's no structure on this aluminum flimsy little can. It's just a way of forming this matrix that is the structure. And so that's the case with bottles or cans. Um, and, and we use them. See, you, I think Kirsten maybe showed you in the slideshow, we started off doing can buildings just as a contrived effort to recycle. That's what, that thinking is what led us to use tires, which now is beyond. I mean, I don't care if it's recycling or not on tires because there's such a bomber way to build in terms of mass, in terms of structure indigenous to the entire planet and so on. And which brings me to this question, the bearing strength of tires. Uh, of course Kirsten showed you the cement truck driving up on a loaded tire wall, that sort of, that's the way I got it approved in the old days, uh, 25, 30 years ago. I took that picture down to the state authorities and I said, you know, I want to build some buildings this way and I showed them that picture and everybody in New Mexico drives a pickup truck. And so this old guy on the staff down there uh, got up and said, well, they were because they were all wondering, well, should we let this guy do this or not? Or is he an idiot or whatever? So they, this guy got up and said, well, if you drive your pickup truck through a frame wall, you go through it and out the other side and maybe you break out your windshield. If you drive your truck through one of these walls, you will die. So they all laughed and approved it. That was, that was the approval in those days. And uh, so it's, it's definitely, um, one thing I didn't mention in terms of it is we batter the walls. We do what's called battering the walls. These, these, you can see the slope on this wall. If we're burying up against the building, we slope the wall each course a little bit into the burial. That's called battering that leans the weight of the wall into the weight of the burial and kind of balances it off. Then there's a coefficient of friction from the weight of a 400 pound earth field tire on another one because there's no mortar. It's just weight and mass that hold these things together. The bearing strength secret is uh, our truth. In a normal frame house they make like an 18 inch, 16 or 18 inch wide footing with steel in it and they put a two by six or two by eight wall on it and there's a force going down of the bearing of that wall with the roof and the way the engineers calculate it is they take different soils and they figure out the bearing capacity of the soil and then they figure out the weight coming down and uh, that footing, the purpose of that footing is to spread the force coming down out to being something that will cause that to float on the bearing capacity of the soil. So if it's a real cheesy soil, the footing has to be a little bigger. If it's a real hard soil, the footing can be a little smaller. The average rule of thumb situation is on a frame home, you end up with a 16 to 18 inch wide footing. Well a tire wall is already significantly wider than that. So when the engineers do the takeoff on the tire wall, they find out that the tire wall is already wider than its required footing. So the, the tire wall becomes a monolith that is its own foundation. So tire walls do not need a concrete foundation. When you do the weight coming down and the bearing capacity of the soil, the tire wall is essentially floating on the, uh, on the bearing capacity of, uh, of uh, average soils. 
then yeah, then you take a, a lot of times the conventional footing if it's in an area where you got a frost line, they dig down, they put that 18 inch wide footing in, then they come up with eight inch block or something and then they go up with their frame wall. So you have to go down to below the frost line because say in an area like this, it freezes to three feet down. But in a tire building, you don't have to do that because the tires go up, the earth comes up against them, here's the roof, the three feet down can't get through the thermal wrap and the bearing is occurring eight feet down. So we, in a buried earthship, we recreate the frost line to the point where it's not a, it's, 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 it has no effect on the building. Then the greenhouse out front uh, has usually a couple of tires and uh, sometimes three and we put the leaning face on the greenhouse and then we, we insulate that and out a little and bury that and it's the insulation again that keeps us from letting the frost line get into the bearing of the tires. And at another point there, a concrete footing is brittle, is rigid, and any heaving will crack it. Uh, if you get heaving on, if you did get heaving on a tire wall, there's no way it can crack. It's, it's resilient. It's hard, but it's resilient. So, because the, it's all, it's earth. Earth is more, when you, over time, earth is more liquid than it is rigid. And so there, any heaving that would happen is not going to have much of an effect, if any. And we still block it with rigid insulation. Yeah. On the, the vertical bearing strength, on, uh, did you, did you ever talk to that in Thompson Square Foot? Uh, the in, we have an engineer report that got into that. I just didn't, I read that, but I could see any. any... Then they, I don't think they have come up with a max of what it would take, other than the concrete truck on the tires pretty much. Uh, I mean, that's going to be 2,000 square foot. Yeah. Earth, what are the considerations about putting earth over the roof? Like oh, the roof? so we've done them. The old days we would, uh, we would do that. It's nice. It's a soft uh, situation. Uh, I'm all, you know, I'm into the, uh, the aesthetic effect of these things being as soft as possible. Burial, roof structure, insulation, and in a case like you're talking about, you, get, you bury the roof. Now, the reason we've, we used to do that, the reason we steered away from it was, one, we started observing that a person standing in a room, the ambient temperature that they're going to feel is coming off up to their head height, and that's it, because this is all about ambient temperature, uh, not like a forced air furnace or anything. And so having mass above your head doesn't really achieve anything. What it does do is make your structure have to be a whole lot heavier to, to, in, to support it. And when you have grass on your roof, you don't catch near as much water. And in an area like this, we need, that's why we've gone to metal roofs, uh, is because the metal roofs are so sensitive that we have seen the gutter dripping into the cistern from morning dew. And you won't see that on a grass roof because it just gets absorbed. So due to water catchment, weight, expense, and lack of effect, we don't do grass roofs anymore. What you will see if you walk around, and I'll go into this more tomorrow, the roof on this building was a material called bry, and it goes on with a torch, and it catches really nasty water, so we put acrylic coatings on it to make it catch cleaner water. And they peeled off, so when you, and then we spray foamed it, which you can't get all over the world, so this was a learning experience. The next two buildings are this EPDM, the next building is the EPDM material, it's a rubber. It catches pretty clean water and it lasts 10 or 15 years and it's going to need repair over there on that one pretty soon. Then the next building is when we started moving to metal roofs, but when we got into metal roofs, the detailing of a metal roof is much more involved than a rubber roof. So it caused us to have to try to get the roofs more simple. So then you'll see on these global ones, the roofs are super simple. They're just set up for, for sheets of metal to be laid on there and screwed down and boom, it's done. Catches super clean water. But it did require redesigning the mechanical aspects of the building so there's not a whole bunch of penetrations. We cluster them together. So the whole design of the building is aimed at making the metal roof more simple because the metal roof is so valuable in terms of catching water. 
So all of these things go in together, yeah. So with the, with the metal roof and that's facing north now, in the winter does the snow still melt? And the well, uh, I'll go into that more thoroughly tomorrow, but since you ask it, I'll answer that part of it. This building was old school. I mean, I, it, Kirsten probably showed you up at Reach, the steep community in the mountains. What we observed up there, it gets a lot, they get more snow up there than down here. There'd be two feet of snow on the roof, and the roofs were north facing, uh, like that. The, the glass on the front was south facing, and here's the building. And we'd get a bunch of two foot of snow on the roof, and it, we'd just watch it evaporate, no water. And so we had one other roof that just by chance, due to the mountain, was sloped this way. And we watched that roof on a day like today, melting and water running into the cistern. Observation was a south-facing roof is going to catch water, a north-facing roof is not. So we changed all of our designs to do this kick, this uh, south-facing roof, kicking back up with the greenhouse, just like here, to uh, south-facing roof. It could be very subtle, we observed, to get a, uh, just a bit of sun rays on it to melt the snow, kicking back up at the winter sun angle to get, still get the heat, created a valley which caught water, but due to our inexperience in, in uh, water catching roofs, you know, if you've got a roof like this, you can make a mistake and you may have a drip. If you've got a roof like this and you make a mistake, you've got water on a coffee table in a living room in a lawsuit. So, uh, back in court. Uh, but the, so this is just more expensive to detail. And with metal, it's kind of, you know, that corrugated metal roofing that's really the most sensitive and best material. It's a lifetime material to use for a roof with this kind of a roof design is expensive, problematic, and whatever. And we did it. We did it at Corner Cottage. We put rubber going up under the metal, and it's expensive. But it works. It works great at Corner Cottage. But we're always trying to get these things to be more affordable. So what we did was we observed, okay, when the sun's out, the snow on the roof. This is, this is the case with every aspect of those six points. We've gone through trial and error, learning. And, you know, there was no books about this stuff. We just had to try it and fail. Failure is a big... Uh, failure is not allowed in the real world, really. You get sued. But it's really... We're hope, we, what we have here is a forum for failure, basically, because failure is where we've learned everything. Uh, so you have a couple feet of snow. The sun hits it, and it melts. When the sun is not out, the south-facing roof is doing no good because the snow's not melting. So what our observation is, okay, when the sun's out, we're melting snow. Well, why can't we take that just a, a step further? You've got a north-facing roof. The sun's out. It's not going to melt. So we put panels, water uh, glycol panels up here that pipe water in tubes through the back of the metal roof, it melts underneath the snow and convex up the metal roof. The gutter's right here. So again, whenever the sun's out, we are running a little pump and running hot water from the panels underneath the two feet of snow and getting a trickle of water. It, it works when the sun's out. When the sun's not out, it doesn't work, but neither does this. And what we have is we did the math. This roof ends up being... 10 to 15 grand cheaper than this roof with all the things considered. So we knocked, you know, it takes two or three grand to do this little system, which then also doubles as a domestic hot water. So in the, in the rest of the year, we, this gives us a tank full of hot water, which I'll go into more tomorrow. Uh, so it, it's killing two birds with one stone. We're still melting water, and it saves us a whole lot of money on the roof. So what you'll see on the later buildings, the one that Kirsten's going to take you to called Sutton tomorrow, is you'll see the solar electric panels across the front, and then you'll see two big other kind of panels. They are the panels that heat the hot water to melt the snow and to give you domestic hot water. So on the front of the Sutton house, say, and I'm getting a little bit into systems, which is more tomorrow, you're going to see the photovoltaic panels, and then you're going to see these two square panels that collect water to heat the roof and in between them is another little panel that runs the pump that pushes the water so it doesn't 
uh, it doesn't steal power from your domestic household power system. It just, whenever the sun's out, you got water melting your roof. If you don't want it, you got hot water for your bath. And so that's just uh, the, you know, the, we consider all of these things, we keep learning, we keep evolving, and the building keeps getting more simple and easier to build and uh, cheaper and so on. Did you have a question? Yeah, when you go to design like a customer ship or something, what are some of the things that go through your head? Uh, things that go through my head. <laughs> uh, well, in, in, in five words or less. <laughs> Let's see, bacon, margaritas. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, well, that's, in a way, that's a good question because, first of all, I try to talk people out of doing a customership <laughs> because a customership is not as good as this. You know, it's like going to Dodge Motors and, and there's a, you know, there's a, a Chrysler sitting on the showroom floor and you want, to customize, you want to customize it, if they would even do it for you, it'd cost a fortune. The thing that they build is what works. They just build more expensive ones or cheaper ones. So I, uh, but I do customize the buildings to a particular climate. For instance, getting back to our same old uh, global earthship here that I've been drawing all morning uh, with the battered wall, the thermal wrap, uh, the uh, now north-facing roof that we've explained, the double greenhouse, uh, and the convection engine, and the tubes, and all of that. Okay, if I'm going to, then I apply that to what, what I do. The first thing I do, if, if, if you, when a client will tell me where they live, I'm, I'm still going to, this is what I start with. But then I get the annual rainfall. If they have a lot of rain, that means I can have uh, smaller cisterns and uh, uh, probably have to have more solar panels. Uh, I also get, so I get the rainfall and I get the, uh, the uh, winter low and the summer high. Now, here our winter low is 30 below, not sustained, but every once in a while in the night in the winter it gets down there early morning. And summer is 105 or something like that, 104. Uh, so if you've got a winter low of 40 below, and uh, so I, I collect that data. you got a winter below of 40 below, but another thing I get is the number of Sundays. We have here 300 on average Sundays a year. Some place in Maine may have 35 or 40 below, similar to us, but they have 200 Sundays a year, or 190. So I, that information tells me how to tweak the design. So in the serious situation, I would say probably add the third greenhouse. You'll see it at the Phoenix. There are places in the Phoenix that have the three glass faces. Uh, then I, the thermal wrap that we put on the uh, the thermal wrap that we put on the around the building to insulate the mass, we would take it and put it under the floor, just in the living area where the people are. We don't need to put it for the plants, but you'd go down and insulate about 18 inches because uh, you're, 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 you know, you're, stretch, you're trying to stretch all of these aspects to give you a little bit better performance to make up for the lack of sun. And so uh, there are tricks like that if you uh, you, the, the things that are adjustable are a few tweaks on uh, insulation, greenhouse. Uh, if you have less sun, then your power system, which I'm going into tomorrow, gets into more panels. Like we did one in Vermont. We did insulate the floor like this. Uh, we just simply doubled the power system. We found out that they have about half the amount of Sundays as us, so we doubled the power system. We actually put two full-on power systems in. And uh, that's interesting because we, these power systems are designed for earth ships. You can't take our power system and hook it onto a regular house because a regular house has a lot more demand. Uh, the things that we encounter like with the, the that we, that, that have taught us to 
point that out to people is we built one of the early buildings before they were called earthships, pit houses, which worked similar, but it was just before we, we copyrighted the name earthship and everything. And, and the people moved in it and uh, they, everything was working and everything. Well, they called up one day and said, your power system is not working. And so I talked to them on the phone uh, for a while and found out that uh, uh, they, you know, I was, I was quizzing them. I was trying to troubleshoot and find out why the power system wasn't working. Uh, and, and they said, well, we got some guests. And I said, well, that, you know, guests can tax the situation. They said, well, it's not really hurting anything because they're over here in their Winnebago right next to us. But the Winnebago was plugged into the house with all of its fans and refrigerators and everything. So it took me an hour phone conversation to find out that they had plugged a Winnebago into the building. The power system is made to run the building. It's not limitless power. So lots of things like that have happened to, to you know, so you have to point out to people, this power system is integral to your life in your home. And, uh, you know, if you plug in your Winnebago, it's not going to work. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.